I'm Stephen Hartov, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Stephen Hartwell. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. We are now more than 350 episodes in and not slowing down anytime soon. It's because of you, the loyal listeners who tune in each day to Author Stories to hear the best author interviews around, and I just wanted to say thank you. On the right-hand sidebar of the website at hankgarner.com, you can find links where you can subscribe to the show, and it helps other people find the show. The more people subscribe, the higher we go in the rankings, and the easier people find us. Uh, I'd like to thank some sponsors uh, this week for uh, for helping us bring the show to you. I, your humble host, I have a brand new book out. It's called The Pandora Codex. Oliver Weber, book one, A Closely Guarded Secret, A Stolen Artifact, and A Madman Trying to Open a Portal to Hell. Can Oliver Weber become the hero he's meant to be? Pick up the Pandora Codex now. It's the first book in the Oliver Weber series. The second book, Jacob's Ladder, comes out very soon. Go ahead, dig into this series. Grab it now. You won't be disappointed. Uh, my friend Patricia Gilliam has a new series called Series Craft 101, and she has a series uh, of books, uh, the fictional character creator workbook, setting and world building workbook. If you are looking to uh, to put together a long running series like Patricia has done, uh, these are some things that she's learned and that she can help you to get on top of that makes managing a long series uh, much easier. Go check it out. There's a link in the show notes, and we'll be talking about it more. Bokera Brumley has a new book called Imani Earns Her Cape. It's a middle grade novel. You might have heard us talk about it on the show uh, just a week or so ago when Bokera was on. A 12-year-old Imani should be celebrating the most important day of her life by eating Murfruit, casting fl- uh, flying spells, and laughing with her mother, but there's just one massive problem. Her mother's been kidnapped by a giant troll, and now Imani is lost in the Fey realm with no way home back to Virginia. Completing her rite of passage alone is inadvisable, but if Imani doesn't want to lose the only family she's ever had, she may have no choice. Transportal train travel, underwater cities, submarines, sea dragons, An unexpected family all combined in Imani Earns Her Cape. Thanks for listening to the show. At the end, as always, we have an audiobook clip from my friend Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Stephen Hartov on the show with me. Stephen has a brand new book that is out today, and it's called The Soul of a Thief. And I think you guys are really going to love this book. Uh, Stephen is an amazing writer, and uh, I'm really happy to have him on the show today. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Hey, thank you very much, Hank. I really appreciate your inviting me on. It's a wonderful show, and you've got some great guests prior to me, so I'll try to uh, live up to them. <laughs> well, let's try not to break our streak today. How about it? <laughs> um, uh, Stephen, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? The first memory I actually have of wanting to be a writer was when I was a kid and my mom came, I can see her. She came into my bedroom in in a little town in Southern Connecticut and handed me a copy of a book called The Guns of Navarone by Alistair McLean. And uh, now, of course, I had been reading, you know, all those little um, sort of middle school adventures and, and, and elementary school adventures, the Hardy Boys and that sort of thing. And I loved all those books, but something about that book. I was just old enough to really understand some great adventure writing and it just nabbed me. That's, uh, I, I think those, uh, some of those, those great young uh, adventure stories really uh, shaped a lot of us. And there's something about, uh, 
you know, when you grow up in, in small town America or, or, or wherever you grow up and, and you, you read these stories of, of things that are bigger than, than you can imagine. Uh, I think they, they really shape, uh, the way you look at the world later in life. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. And, um, you know, then you get a thirst for reading about more exotic places and adventures and, and, uh, you know, I think some people are inspired to go out and do those things themselves so they can write about them. Some people are just inspired to, to keep reading and drinking them in from, from their, you know, their position at their typewriter, typewriter back then, or a uh, computer. Uh, I was one of those kids who the more I read, the more I wanted to do it myself. And that sort of pushed me out into the world for quite a while before I actually started writing my own stuff. Well, you know, there's uh, there is definitely something to be said uh, for traveling the world with your imagination and and writing stories about places that you would that you would love to go and, and using your uh, kind of the, the fantastical part of your imagination to to uh, kind of vicariously live through experiences that, that we are not able to uh, participate in. Uh, but then there's also no um, substitute for being in the thick of it and then reporting back to the world on what you've seen. I totally agree with that. I mean, I, you know, I was also, as I got older, I was, uh, I became a fan of the classic sort of uh, mid-century, early century, mid-century, the last century, of course, authors, you know, the, the Fitzgeralds and the Hemingways and, and, and the folks that had, you know, you couldn't at that time, Hank, get, an experience of another place without actually going there. I mean, you might read a newspaper article about Paris, but you weren't going to smell it or see the colors unless you got on a boat. And uh, now, now writers can go into their computer and, and literally walk down a street in Sarajevo, but you couldn't do that back then. So the romantic aspect of, of having a writer who had been someplace bring you to that place really enthralled me. And I thought that the only way for me to actually write adventures about these places was to get myself there. Now, if you're a science fiction author, for example, you're creating that world. No one else has been there. So you're sort of free to, to, to paint that canvas any way you wish. But if you're going to write a spy story about Moscow, I think it behooves you to get there if you can. And if you can't, you know, nowadays you have the research capabilities that we never had when I was a kid. Right. Well, and, and even though you can walk down a street of Sarajevo uh, with Google Maps and Street View and all of that, um, you still cannot relate um, the, the smell of spices coming from a, a particular shop or, uh, you know, the, the burn of vodka, uh, you know, when you're in that little Correct. Russian town, that there, there, there are certain visceral things that you still need to kind of be boots on the ground, uh, to, to get your, get your head around. If Absolutely. you're going to, if Absolutely. you're going to, if you're going to communicate that, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, visceral, uh, five senses, uh, sort of uh, experience to the reader. I, I totally agree. I, I'm, and I'm not sure, you know, there are great writers who, who can't get out of their chairs for whatever reason, you right. know, they're con or they're confined to their little town in, in whatever country and they just can't go someplace. And they probably, I don't really know, Hank, how, how, you know, how everybody formulates their world, but I'm sure that there are writers who figure out a way to just give us enough of a taste based on research and then fill the story so believably with dialogue and character that we don't realize that they haven't actually been able to get to that place. But I can't do that. I'm not that talented. I pretty much have to have walked the sidewalk to do it. I'm not one of those one of those writers. Yeah. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It comes down to character in, in that instance that uh, what you cannot effectively convey an atmosphere, uh, you have to really make me fall in love with your character. Exactly. Yeah, exactly yeah. true. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you you ventured out into the world in 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 search of adventure. Uh, what did what did you decide to do uh, when you when you left your parents' home and, and set out into the world? Oh, I did all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean, I um, as most I writers went off have. To college. <laughs> most writers have. Yeah, I went off to college, um, 
and I was in school in Boston for a couple of years and just was so itching to get out and see something other than, uh, you know, my home country and, and the town where I was going, the city where I was going to school. So I, I left college and joined the Merchant Marines uh, in, the, in the middle of my, you know, college career. And then I went off and sailed around the world as a young merchant sailor. This is way back in 1973. Uh, wound up in the Middle East. There was a war there. Uh, my dad showed up when I was going to stay over there, and he dragged me home and said, you're finishing college first. So I did that. And uh, then I went back out again when college was over. I came from um, sort of an interesting family background. My mom was an Austrian refugee from, from Nazi Austria, Nazi Germany. And um, so I was sort of compelled to uh, go overseas and uh, wound up in Israel, wound up joining the Israeli army there. I served there for a number of years. I came back to the States and started writing. And um, by that time, I had sort of been so many different places that I thought I had enough in my feed bag to, to, to work for a while. Um, do you have a Israeli citizenship? I actually do because I, I, it was given to me when I joined their service. We had a few survivors from the family who had wound up over there. And um, I sort of followed in their footsteps and, and was a paratrooper. And then I was a, uh, in a, an Army Intelligence Reconnaissance Unit. And the military was always very attractive to me for a number of different reasons. And when I came back to the States after 9-11, I joined the New York Guard. So I'm still, you know, I'm still wearing a uniform once a month. And I guess I've been in three different services and <laughs> a sailor and a paratrooper and now an old guy, but uh, still How doing cool. it. So, um, and it cool. still feeds the writing career. So oh, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what brought you around to writing? Uh, because b before the uh, the current book that you have out, The Soul of a Thief, that uh, releases today, as we said, um, you've written um, uh, some some other um, military political thrillers, but uh, they're set uh, in, in present day, uh, more or less. Uh, which is a, a little bit of a departure from the, the new book that's out now. And, and I'm seeing the threads that brought the new book out. Uh, but tell me about the, these other books that you wrote and how did you switch gears uh, from what you were doing and that brought you back around to writing? Well, the first, um, uh, first, uh, the first thing I wrote was a, you know, a, a ridiculously long and cumbersome war novel that never got published. <laughs> and uh, the desk you know, everybody novel. does want to, Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Death Row novel. Everybody does one of those first. And that's how I got my first big agent, uh, got my representation using that book. And then I published uh, one after the other, a trilogy of espionage novels, The Heat of Ramadan, uh, The Nylon Hand of God, and The Devil's Shepherd. And th that was like a 10-year project. And those were sort of, uh, it was a trilogy, and the characters were three books. And then I stood down from that uh, for a while and I did a nonfiction book uh, with a fellow named Michael Durant. It's called In the Company of Heroes. And he was the fellow who was shot down and captured in the event we know as Black Hawk Down. Ah. So I co-wrote his book with him. So that was nonfiction military. And then after that, along with uh, a colonel named Robert Johnson, a great guy, also a helicopter pilot, the three of us wrote a book called The Night Stalkers, which is about these elite Army aviation helicopter pilots. And thereafter, I wrote a book. I was in Afghanistan, and I wrote a book with a combat photographer called uh, Afghanistan on the Bounce. And in between all these things, I would ghostwrite things on occasion, which, you know, some of us do, um, you know, it's part of, part of the living of being a working writer. And I also ran a magazine for six years, a military magazine. I was the editor in chief of that. But this current book was noodling around in my head for years and years and years. And, uh, it, you know how it is, Hank, sometimes a book is just begging you to write it. And I sat down one day and I said, okay, I surrender. And I wrote it. And uh, it was about World War II. And I guess I'd been 
cooking this thing did, and it just came out. So uh, the the contrast between the new book, which is a World War Two book, like you said, and the um, uh, the series, the the trilogy that began with the heat of Ramadan, um, what was the uh, when you approach uh, each of these different projects, uh, do you approach them differently? Does the 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 espionage thr- thrillers that are more modern day um, are they easier or harder to write than than the new project? Uh, does does being closer to the events uh, help or hinder the creative process? Boy, it's an interesting exploratory question because. That trilogy was very close to experiences I had just had in the Middle East, so that that made it easy to feed the beast, so to speak. Right. Um, So I would say that I was just starting my writing career at the time, and my agent at the time um, was sort of mentoring me in how you write an outline and plot uh, structure or structure a plot. And um, so there were some more mechanical aspects of creating those books that I had to learn and followed throughout the series. This book was totally different. This book was sort of, uh, there was no outline to it. And um, it sort of felt like, you know, you get to that point in your career where sometimes you have a story and you, you just, you don't need to, plot it so much you just need to sit down and write it right uh so um a lot of times when that happens for me um i i have a character that is kind of bigger than life and a a lot of times writing that character and 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 what he or she gets into uh is kind of like i'm i'm sitting back and reporting on what i'm seeing this character do um which came first to you uh, with the soul of a thief did did the character or did the did you first have the setting and think okay i want to craft a story around this particular time or place okay so this is interesting because we have the same experience i also um have that it's i, I wouldn't call it sort of objective observation but it's almost like the character is telling you what he or she is going to do next. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. It's, it's not like it's just a movie playing out in your head and, and you're, you're dictating. Um, but there's a, there's certain symbiotic relationship between you and that character. And, and, and there's, there's no good way to explain it. It, it just happens. And no matter how you explain it, it sounds weird, but I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> no, I know exactly what you, I know exactly what you're talking about. As a matter of fact, my my previous works have all been I wouldn't call them mechanical, but, you know, they they were plotted out logically. And sometimes your plot gets away from you or a character says to you, no, I'm not going in that room because that doesn't make sense to me. I'm going over here and this makes more. So you change your plot. You know, it just you know, you adjust according to the inspiration of the moment or the character or whatever. In this particular book. It was a very strange experience. The book, the, one of the central points of the plot of the book came from a recurring dream I used to have when I was a kid. So I had sort of lived with this character or these two characters my whole life in the back of my mind. And when I sat down to write it, it was almost like channeling. I know that sounds weird, but, you know, It's just the two of us talking here. Nobody's listening. That's right. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) So it was almost like channeling. It was like my wife tells me that I would come to bed at three o'clock in the morning and say, I don't know what's going on, but I just wrote 3000 words. And, you know, it was like it wasn't me. I just sat down there and it came out and I'm on chapter five. Maybe I don't know what's going to happen next, but something is. (laughs) And so... There are so many. Different... There are so many writers shaking their head right now. Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and that was a different experience for me. I was much more methodical about all this until this book, and um, this one told me what was going to happen, and I just listened and typed. So. so- 
so give us the setup for the story. What uh, what is happening uh, to whom, and and what is the what's the soul of the story? Well, this is a story about a 19 year old Austrian kid who, in 1943, is I don't want to say abducted, but essentially abducted by an SS colonel in the Wehrmacht. You know, an SS colonel plucks him from his job as an orderly in a hospital in Vienna and makes him his adjutant for whatever reason. He likes the way he looks. He likes the way he acts. He grabs this kid. And the SS colonel doesn't realize that this kid has a great grandmother who's Jewish, which makes the kid a Mischling, which in German means sort of a mixed race, you know, non, not, pure, not pure Aryan blood. So this colonel is a swashbuckling you know, afraid of nothing commando. And this kid is along for the ride. And the book takes place for the most part in France. Some parts of it do not, but for the most part in France in 1943, 44, um, Stefan, the kid uh, winds up going along on these raids because he has to, because the colonel demands that he does. And these are horrific things for him, being exposed to warfare and you know commando raids and all this sort of thing. What he discovers through the course of the book is that Himmel, the, the SS colonel, is a very wily fellow who knows that Germany is going to lose the war. And Himmel has plans to... Um, get out of it before the Allies, you know, whip Germany. And he's going to abscond to South America. And before he does that, though, he is going to rob an Allied paymaster train. Now, in addition to all of that drama, Himmel has a French mistress who is essentially his hostage. And, of course, Stefan falls in love with her. So now you have this triangle. And uh, that's the setup, and it all occurs right before D-Day in France. So I won't tell you the rest yeah. because that'll be a spoiler. But that's that's what the book's about. A absolutely, and uh, and everyone needs to go out and get a copy of this because it's on sale today, and you won't be disappointed. I promise. Um, but uh, Stephen, how uh, how close was this story to you and to your uh, your family history? I, I know you. Uh, you know, you mentioned about your mother and, and her uh, Austrian roots. Uh, was any of this uh, close to your heart uh, in that sense when you were writing it? Oh, very. Um, I mean, I grew up with my grand, you know, my grandparents, uh, my mother's parents, and my mother and her brother were the only survivors of their immediate family. They escaped to America. Her brother, uh, as a teenager, basically joined the American army and went back to Europe to fight from Normandy to Berlin. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a house where German was spoken all the time. My grandparents spoke German to each other. So I was immersed in that culture. But there were aspects of the family history that only came out later as I became an adult. For example, my great Uncle Alexander, um, he himself was a Mischling, a partial Jew, and he joined the Luftwaffe to, to sort of keep himself safe. He served in the German Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, for a year and a half before they figured him out. He was actually turned in, and they sent him to a concentration camp, which he survived. But, um, and he also met my great aunt, in the concentration camp, which probably would be defined as the worst first date ever, I think. <laughs> yeah, but, I, th I think uh, that's safe to say. Yeah, I think we're safe to say that. But they both survived, and now Uncle Alexander, to anyone, as far as he was concerned, his life started in 1945. He didn't talk about the camps. He didn't talk about the Luftwaffe. But when he died, we found an envelope taped to the back of his, the toilet tank in his apartment in, in his flat in Vienna. And in it were photographs that had been taken by him and his comrades of his time in German uniform. 
that he was ashamed to show to anyone. Um, so that sort of stuff fed, and probably over many years, fed this idea that was growing in my mind about this young man who's caught in this horrible conundrum. And uh, there we are. Wow. Wow. Um, you mentioned it about your great uncle and, and, and feeling like his, his life started uh, at the end there. Um, I had uh, a grandfather and great uncles that served in World War II, and they would never, ever talk about the war. You, you couldn't get them to talk about it. My wife has, has uncles and, and stuff that, that served in the war, and you can't, couldn't get a story cracked out of them for anything, um, and right. uh, which, which is very different, it, it seems like, uh, from some of our modern warfare, and uh, it, maybe it's that it plays out on, on television and the internet, and I, I don't know what it is, but there, there seems to be a, a different kind of feeling um, to it. And, and now we have this great um, uh, kind of um, surge of, of great literature that's coming out about this time, your book uh, included, and there's been a lot of great books and, and authors that I've had over the last couple of years that are writing some of these really compelling stories and, and peeling back some of the layers and giving us a glimpse of, of what it uh, uh, was or, or could have been like then. Um, what do you think it is about the difference in what we're going through as a society and uh, in the world now compared to what was happening in the 1940s and the, the sort of uh, not, not secrecy afterwards, but just the unwillingness to, to keep uh, having it in the conversation at large. I think it's really interesting, Hank. And I do, because I'm still in the service and, and I see, <clears throat> what what you just described, the difference between the modern behavior of veterans or people who've just come back from downrange and the behavior of our, what we'll call the greatest generation, you know, the, the, the folks who fought during World War II and even Korea. That was, it was a different culture back then in many ways. People didn't speak about private matters so openly in general. We, di we didn't have social media we didn't have the ability to, you know, to sort of openly uh, self-therapize about a lot of these things and discuss them and, and rehash them and so forth. And it was also sort of a, a mannered mode of behavior to not talk about these horribly unpleasant things. I mean, you know, these guys saw stuff that, I, they just couldn't, there was no way to discuss that with a civilian. Right, right. Um, and, and I now don't we mean, still have, go and, ahead. And I, I don't mean to denigrate um, them then or, uh, or, or veterans now. It's, it's just an observation that, that it just seems to be different. No, it is totally different. And it's not a question of denigrating them because our culture has changed. Right. You right. know, uh, I mean, just look at at many things in our culture, in our political spectrum. There was a time when I was a kid uh, that where, you know, the politicians may have been doing these nasty things, but we didn't discuss it. It wasn't talked about. During World War II, the the War Department for, forbade any any showing of pictures of um, dead American troops. Um, you know, and there was no such thing as instant video. I mean, that, you know, the, the, the real time exposure to war didn't happen for us until Vietnam. And even that was mostly film that would reach us a week after the event. Now it's like, boom, you see it right now. Right. Well, I mean, during, during that time, uh, uh, President Roosevelt wouldn't even be uh, photographed in his wheelchair. Like it was, it, it was, Correct. uh, it, you know, that we, we had a, uh, uh, a, a very much a, a sensitivity to that sort of thing. Correct. And the press yeah. uh, respected and protected those sensitivities. And, right. Right. Um, I, I think we didn't pry into the experiences of our veterans back in that day. And nor did they feel, I think they felt it was almost like a dishonor for them to discuss those private horrors 
Uh, it was their job to go do what they did, and then it was over, and it was back to the world, and forget about it, all that. It was nasty. We had to do it. It's done. Yeah. And that's different now. Um, not that, you know, not that our combat veterans come back and want to talk about all this stuff because they don't, but we pry into it. We pry <laughs> into it. We want to see it. We're always looking for it. We're sending reporters over there. Everybody's got a, you know, a video, a camera, whatever. So, yeah, it's a different culture. Uh, so uh, when you start to write a book like The Soul of a Thief, um, uh, what's the, the process like uh, of, of research uh, or maybe maybe not research, but just kind of immersing yourself in that time and place so that when you start telling the story, you have all of the, the correct tools uh, to, to pull from out of your toolbox? Yeah. I, I would like to say that <clears throat> I sat down and read tons and tons of books about World War II and France and, you know, the, the German army and so forth to, to prepare for this book, but I did not. I think I was exposed to so much of this stuff over the course of my life that by the time I got to it, it was uh, sort of an easy, in quotes, um, creative process. Later on, after I finished the entire manuscript, I went back, of course, to check um, details and make sure that I had, you know, dates roughly correct and town names roughly correct and, and that sort of thing. But it wasn't a heavily researched book, not, not that it didn't need to be. It was just that I feel like I had done that research for four decades, and it was sort of at my fingertips at that point. Um, the thing that that is different about this book is the language and it's a memoir being written by a very old man about his youth so the language is sort of the language of a of a man who was raised 70 years ago you know 60 right. years ago uh that was something that I'm not sure where that came from, but I think it came from my elders, from hearing the way they spoke, particularly my grandfather, uh, who died quite a while ago, but he was sort of that, you know, young Austrian youth at one time, and I heard him speak for decades, and so I think it sort of followed the lilt of his tone and rhythm. Um, one of the, the most... Uh compelling uh, or one of the things that makes this such a compelling read is uh, because it because of the character's viewpoint uh, that you talked about and that uh, we don't often get to witness uh, this part of history from uh, the vantage point that you drop us into in this book. Uh, most of the time it's, uh, it, you're, we're, we're talking about the allies and, um, and, and we're seeing everything from their vantage point and you drop us on the other side and, and get to have that, uh, that point of view uh, for the reader. Was that, uh, uh, obviously you're, you're writing from what you know and, and from what your family, uh, has, has handed down and, and, and shared with you. Um, was that ever a challenge in, uh, portraying that side of the war? It was. Um, you know, Hank, we have and justifiably uh, immortalized these fascist Nazi German characters as very difficult to write about in any sympathetic way. But, and, and I know you do this too, and I think all really, at least people who are fine writers or aspire to be fine writers, um, try never to judge their antagonists because when you, when you portray antagonists in a cliched sort of villainous way, they're instantly boring. Um, so I had to set aside the fact that, that these folks were all, you know, SS troops and just make them troops. You know what right. I mean? Right. Well, and and uh, not only do they become boring uh, when you portray them that way, uh, but we all read books uh, 
because we want to understand the human condition. Uh, we, we read different genres and the, the window dressing up story changes depending on the genre. Uh, but we're, we're all coming because we want to understand, uh, ourselves, our place in the world and, and how others, uh, you know, react in the same world. And if we, if we portray antagonist in a, in a two dimensional way like that, we're missing out on, on this part of the human condition and trying to understand why the world winds up the way it does. Absolutely. And, you know, it's an, it's a really easy way out to turn a character, you know, an antagonist into a, into a Blofeld. Um, And then you wind up with sort of a cartoonish James Bond, who's the hero who actually, I don't think is cartoonish because he's got so many flaws, but, you know, Blofeld is definitely, you know, the villain with the, you know, the bald head and the, whatever. Um, he's, a, he's a cliche. And you, it's just what you just said. When you do that, you fail to explore motivation. Um, you always feel like this character can be eliminated without you having any, any experiential you know, feelings about that. And uh, I've never liked that that kind of portrayal, that kind of sort of two-dimensional portrayal of writing. And I did the same thing in my espionage trilogy. My terrorists are never unmotivated. And they're usually um, justified, in quotes, you know, in the things that they are attempting to do. Because well, otherwise, otherwise they're just boring. Yeah, right. Well, every antagonist believes that they are the hero of their story. Exactly. No, no, the way that the way the rest of the world judges that may be, <laughs> you know, maybe completely different. But in in their mind, they they are doing what they believe needs to be done. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, when you um, when you got to the end of the writing of this book, uh, were you? Uh, did, well, first off, did you know where you were going uh, when you started? Because you you talked about, um, you know. It, knowing the characters and, and knowing uh, uh, kind of watching what happened, but did you understand where the, the story was going to end up before you started? I, I think I did. And um, <clears throat> I hadn't laid it out in any sort of outline, but I could picture it in my mind who was left and who was not, if that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, in sort of, uh, you know, a miasmic way. Yes. I don't, it wasn't, you know, precisely laid out who was going to do what to whom or whatever, but yeah, I, I knew, I don't think, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I basically can't sit down to write a novel unless I know how it ends, at least in some form or another, because you're working toward that objective, right? Exactly. I, I think when I sit down to write, I usually have uh, a pretty, uh, a pretty great hook for the beginning. Uh, I know what's wh- what engages me in the story. Uh, I'm pretty sure is going to engage someone else. What's what's going to grab my attention, and then uh, right. I, u- I usually have kind of a uh, an ending scene, or at least a, an emotional point, or some sort of resolution. And and like you said, I'm I'm writing toward that resolution the whole time. Yeah, I I, I think that's the way most people do it. And, you know, uh, like you, I belong to some writing groups and some writing group groups on Facebook and stuff. And I'll watch a lot of conversations. And I, I find it very interesting that there are people who say, uh, well, I'm pantsing this one, meaning I'm, I'm writing it by the seat of my pants. And I'll, I'll find out what happens as it happens. And for me, that's like, you know, oh, man, you're, you're standing on the edge of the cliff. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> if you have no idea what's going to happen in your book, you don't know where you're going and you wind up writing all over the place and, you know, you can't create the, the moments of tension or character development, the arcs and all that stuff. But maybe there are people that who can do that. I can't. Well, uh, my friend uh, Chuck Manley describes it like this. He he calls it pantsing with a plan um, that, that he has some, ro- some road markers set along the way. And then he just allows the characters to do what they're going to do between there. And uh, I, I really like that. I, I, I like that, uh, that knowing where my destination is, but but holding it kind of loosely along the way. Yeah, I think that's great um, yeah. if you can do that. On the other hand, if your publisher says... I want to see an outline of your next proposal. <laughs> you can't exactly pants that. You got to show them what you got. 
Yeah, or or you turn in a completely different book than you proposed. <laughs> yeah, if you can get away, if you can get away with that, and they don't want the advance back, that's awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it is. Scratch that, scratch that. Um, <laughs> Stephen, um, what do you hope people take away from the soul of a thief when when they close the book at the end? Uh, what do you hope they're left with? Well, I hope they're going to want to read the prequel and the sequel, which I'm planning on uh, on next. But I, I haven't gotten to that point yet. But but there there is more to to this story uh, about what happened before this these events and what happens afterwards, which I think they'll understand when they read the book. Um, that that this is sort of um, a setup for many other characters involved in in this book to have their lives. Yeah, inspected and so forth. But I think more than anything, Hank, if, when people close this book, obviously when people finish your book, you always want them to think, wow, that was great. I'm sorry it's over, right? Um, but I, I always hope when I've written something that folks will feel like they learned something that they didn't know before and that they judged people less because of what they learned. So that's sort of my objective with this one. Well, that's a, uh, that's a powerful order. Uh, but, but I think that, uh, that this book can pull that off. Um, Stephen, I love the book. It's fantastic. Um, the, the soul of a thief is out today. We're going to send everybody to go pick up a copy of it. Uh, where can people find you if they're just now learning about you and your work and, and want to follow along with, uh, what, with what happens next? Oh, appreciate that, Hank. First of all, uh, thank you very much for telling people that uh, that you like it, and, and I think they will like it. Um, it's uh, I'm all you know. You can just Stephen Hartov. You can just H uh, A R T O V. You can plug me into Google. You'll find my website. You'll find me on Facebook. Uh, the books everywhere on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. Tar it's selling everywhere, pretty much, uh, in various formats. Uh, in, in uh, audio as well. But um, yeah, my website, stephenhartov.com is where people can find me or they can send me an email from there if they'd like to chat. You know, you just press the button that says send Stephen an email. And uh, I do like to engage with people, especially people who are into writing or other writers and so forth. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm here in this digital world that <laughs> they've created. Excellent. Uh, Stephen, uh, I wish you the utmost success with uh, The Soul of a Thief, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to that prequel and sequel that you, that you talked about. You, uh, you piqued my interest. So when those come out, will you please come back on the show and let's talk about them? I'll be happy to, and Hank, thank you very much, and good luck with all of your interviews and, and your own wonderful books, and uh, we shall meet again. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night... Give me your answer. Which one would mom kill us for watching? Said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, child of the jackal? The omen! And we might have time for omen too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil. 
born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any. And Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about, hmm, scary blackout? Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? he whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 